are indeed glad that you've chosen to worship with us this day. This is Memorial Day weekend, and I want to acknowledge our veterans. If you are a veteran out there, man or woman, I want to say thank you, as our congregation wants to say thank you for the freedom that we have because of your sacrifice of serving our country. I also want to reach out to those families who, this is not a happy time. Their loved one did not come home from service. And so I want you to know that we have not forgotten this, the ultimate sacrifice that was made, that your loved one gave their life so that we could have the freedom that we have in this country, the freedom to worship like no other country in the world practically, that we don't have to worry about persecution or oppression uh, so far in this country. There are some things that are starting to be stirred up, but it's because of your loved one's sacrifice that we can have this kind of freedom, the freedom to vote, the freedom to move around freely. You know, when I was in Russia doing some mission work over there, you couldn't go from one province to another without permission. And here, we can drive all over the United States without permission. We can go wherever we want. And it is because of your loved one's sacrifice. And we just want you to know that we have not forgotten in this Memorial Day, and we want to remember that. If you know a, a living vet, a uh, veteran, or if you know of a family who has lost a loved one uh, during the course of a war, please reach out to them this weekend. It's so nice to know that their loved one has not been forgotten. It's so nice to know that a veteran who gave up so much has not been forgotten. And so we honor you today, this Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to conclude my series uh, on the sightings of Jesus after the resurrection, but before the ascension today, because next week is Pentecost. And Pentecost is the birthday of the church, and so we will be taking uh, a different direction in, a, in the sermon, starting with next week with Pentecost. One of the things that I think as I looked at all of these sightings that I hope has encouraged you to realize just how powerful the resurrection is. Jesus did uh, raise, rise from the, from the grave. He, he was alive. People saw him. They touched him. They talked with him. They ate with him. And so I hope that as we've looked at each of these sightings, you have been encouraged and your faith has increased with the knowledge of these sightings. Today I want to look at a sighting that for most of us in the church at least, uh, is very familiar to us. We probably could even quote one of the verses in the passage that I'm going to read word for word because we often cite it. We often refer to it in the church. And yet, I think I've preached on this text a number of times since I've been here at Memorial Park over the last 14 years. But today I want to take a little different direction with this passage. Because I think sometimes what has happened is the passage is so familiar that we forget what are the other things in the passage that are just as important. There is a promise before the command is given. There is a promise immediately after the command is given that are very important in order for us to be able to do that command. And I think that sometimes we struggle in trying to do that command because we forget about these promises. And so I want to look at them as well as the command today. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 28. I'll begin reading at verse 16. The passage, of course, is the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
When I look at this passage in the Bible, I think of three things, three R's, rest, responsibility, and reassurance. And so let's look at the first part, rest. In verse 18, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What does authority really mean? Well, I looked it up in the dictionary because I wanted to make sure I was on the same page with what I thought it meant. Authority means somebody who can command something to be done. They have the power to command something to be done. They have the expertise. They are able to influence people's thinking and behaviors because they are the expert. Now, if we run into money problems, where do we go? A lot of us would go to the bank and see the banker because he has the authority to release money to us if he feels that it's appropriate to do so. He also has the authority to turn us down because he's a banker. He knows financial things. When he looks at our financial background, he makes a decision based upon that because he's an expert in that, and he has a pretty good feeling if we're a good risk or we are not a good risk. Or let's say we have an infection and we go see the doctor and he prescribes an antibiotic for us. He's the expert in health. He knows what will help us get better. We don't just walk into a Walmart and look at a whole aisle full of antibiotics and guess which one might help us. We have no idea. We are not an expert in health. We don't know which antibiotic will treat bronchitis versus something else. We rely on the authority of the medical doctor who will guide and direct us of what is the best thing to do to take care of our infection. Jesus is the supreme authority in spiritual matters, wouldn't you say? I mean, I think as the son as both fully human and fully divine, he knows a lot. He knows actually at all about spiritual matters. He is the authority in this area. And I think sometimes we struggle because we forget as we go to the command, we forget that he is the authority and we get so caught up in our enthusiasm or so caught up in the needs that are around us that we just jump right in and we forget to ask him, what should we do? What do you want me to do with this? Do you want me to do this or do you want me to do this? He has given all of us spiritual gifts. Some he has given more than one, but no one has them all. We all need to work together to go about our Father's business. And Jesus has the authority to be able to guide us, tell us which is the way that we should go. But are we listening? Do we seek out his counsel before we say yes to something? You know, we can, um, the reason I use the word rest for his authority is because if we trust in Jesus, we can rest in him. We can put everything in his hands and say, guide me, I will do whatever you ask me. I want to be faithful, but I want you because you know best. I don't. You know what's coming down the road. You know all things. I don't. I have a very narrow view on life. I can only see what is before me, but you see the whole picture. I only see a piece of it. So Jesus, what do you want me to do? You know, people sometimes worry about going down the wrong path. They say, well, how do I know what God's will is for my life? Trust him. He will direct you. And if you are going down the wrong path, trust me, he will change that path. I know all too well. I had convinced myself that God was calling me to be a missionary. But that's not what he was calling me to be. And he did turn my path around. And I have to confess it wasn't particularly pleasant at the time, but he did turn me around to where my giftings better lie. And, you know, I should have realized I'm not a linguistic. I, 
It's very hard for me to learn a foreign language. I took Spanish 101 three, four, five times before I got it down. How would I ever be a missionary in a foreign country and speak their language? That was not a gift that God had given me. He, he wanted me to use my gifting in my native tongue. And so he called me here to be a pastor. He will guide us if we look and seek his will out. And that can give us a rest. The burden of making a mistake or going the wrong way can be lifted because we know that Jesus will guide us. We know that he is the one who will direct us. And so we can find rest in him. Because what happens if we don't trust him, if we don't place ourselves in his hands and let him direct us, what happens? We begin to worry. Are we doing the right thing? We begin to have anxiety. Uh, I, I don't know if this is going to work out. We may even have panic attacks. We, we wonder. We, we begin to feel like, maybe I'm a failure. Maybe I'm going to fail. I, I don't want to make that mistake again, so I won't go there. And sometimes our best lessons are learned through our mistakes, where we can see more clearly where our gifting lies. And so instead of looking at our mistakes in a negative way, we need to be asking ourselves, what can I learn from this? What is God teaching me to be able to use in his work as he guides and directs me? And if we stop worrying and, and leave the anxiety alone and stop being fearful, that gives us the energy then to do the Great Commission. If we don't, we spend all of our energy on ourselves, looking at ourselves, and we have no energy left for his work. So step number one in the Great Commission is to remember Jesus' authority. He has all authority. We can trust him and we can rest in him. And then step number two, of course, the Great Commission that says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Wow, responsibility. A lot of action in these uh, one and a half verses. A lot of present tense. Don't miss that. It isn't just for the first century church that Jesus said this. It wasn't just for the disciples that Jesus said this. He's using the present tense, whoever is reading this now, go and make and teach. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? I think there are three things that we need to be doing in order to be able to even begin to do the Great Commission. And I think sometimes we forget these things as well as we forget the promises that go before and after this command. I think the first thing is, he says go. He does not say come. He does not say came. He says go. Somehow the church has gotten the idea, and for many years has, has thought that people will come to us if we just have the right events in the church, if we just do the right PR, if we have the right music, the right preacher, the right this, the right that, that people will come to us. Jesus knew that was not going to be the case. We need to follow his example. He went out among the people. He didn't wait for them to come to him in the synagogue. He didn't have the 12 disciples sitting around waiting to open the door to let somebody come in that might have a question, that might be wondering who Jesus is. They didn't even know who Jesus was. If he had stayed in the synagogue, who would have known? But instead, he went out. He went out to the people. To the people that probably either couldn't or wouldn't be able to come to the synagogue. The lepers, they weren't allowed in the synagogue. How would they ever get healed? How would they ever hear about Jesus? They were so segregated from society. Who would be there to tell them about Jesus if he had not gone out? There were the, the sinners. The Pharisees complained about Jesus eating with the sinners and the low life of life. 
And yet, how would they have known? Because they probably wouldn't have gone to the synagogue. They wouldn't have felt comfortable with who they were or what they had done. And what an amazing good news they heard when Jesus talked about forgiveness and mercy and grace and compassion. The woman caught in adultery. You know, Jesus went out. He would not have met her if he had been in the synagogue, in the four walls that he was in. Or the poor, who could maybe even afford the temple tax and therefore could not come in. What Jesus did is an example to us. And what he is saying here is just as true today as it was back then. We need to go outside of the four walls of this church, outside of the four walls of our home, and go and find people who need to know about Jesus, who are suffering and need to be comforted, who are having trials and tribulations and need some help. You know, James wrote, what good is it to tell people about Jesus if they're starving, if they have no clothes? We need to meet them where they are. We can't do that in these four walls. We have to go out and see what the needs are. And so Jesus rightfully said, go. Go and make disciples. Now, I think there's three things that we need to keep in mind in order to make disciples. I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that in order to make a disciple, we have to know what a disciple is. You can't make something you know nothing about. I have learned that in these last two months of the coronavirus. Uh, I haven't done a lot of cooking in, in a number of years, and I am cooking a lot now. And sometimes the recipes I make turn out okay, and some of them are a disaster. I have to throw it away. It's awful. It's absolutely awful. The dog wouldn't even eat it, you know, if I had a dog. Um, we have to ourselves be a disciple first before we can go out and make disciples. We have to know what and Jesus is saying here, that we are to teach them, the disciples that we're going to make, to obey everything that he has commanded us. Well, do we know what he has commanded us? Do we know that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul? And do people see that in our lives? Do they see it? The only way they're going to see it is if we're out there among them and know that we love God, that we are faithful to Him, that even in our own trials and tribulations, our reaction to those trials and tribulations are very different than the world because we are trusting and resting in Jesus and know that he is in control. He has the authority. Do they see that in us? Are we a disciple of Christ? Or do we know the commandment that follows that is that we are to, to love our neighbor as ourselves? Do they see that? Or do they see us being kind of snobbish or not being very friendly or keeping to ourselves? It's a sad report in today's society that many do not know their neighbors. One of the best things that has come out of this coronavirus is I've gotten to know the neighbors on both sides of me much better than I ever knew them because I was never home. They never saw me, but now they do from a distance. We have our mask on, but it's become a joy to be able to see them and to wave and discuss our garden problems and, and, and different things. And, and I appreciate that. I'm going to miss that when, um, the whole country reopens again, and I won't be home as much as I have been. That's, that's something that has come out of this. Do, do people see us as being friendly? Or do we remember the, the Ten Commandments? Are we, sh are we showing that in our lives? Are we showing the commandment of do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Or are we all self-centered? And we'll do what's best for us and forget all the others. Sorry that I trampled on you, but I, I was only thinking of myself. We see that today, and, and I'm sorry, I am a health professional as well, registered nurse, but it bothers me when I go out in public, and I'm not out often, but when I do go to the grocery store, that I see people that are not wearing masks. What they're saying to me is I'm not important. Because the mask is not to protect 
them. The mask is to protect me. And the mask that I have worn is to protect them. It shows that I'm concerned about them. That is one great way we can show. If people know that we are believers, we need to have that mask on because it shows that we are concerned about them. It's important that we know what Jesus taught. Do people see us living out those commands and seeing how it betters us, seeing how it makes our lives more joyful and fulfilling and, and all of those things? We need to do that. We need to be a disciple of Jesus Christ first. But we also need to be transparent. You know, that's a new word these days. People are saying, I, I want people to be transparent. I, I want to know who they really are, not who they say they are, or not who they portray they are. I want them to be transparent. How can we be transparent if we're not out among the people? It's very important for them to see that we are genuine in our faith, that we can admit that we don't understand all things, and there are things that we may never understand this side of heaven, but we know enough about God's mercy and grace to put our trust in him, and we can rest in him and be reassured of who he is. And, you know, I, I came across the story of St. Francis of Assisi, and I want to read it to you because I think it really illustrates what it means to be transparent. Francis of Assisi once invited an apprentice to go with him to a nearby village to preach. The young monk quickly agreed, seizing the opportunity to hear his teacher preach. When they arrived in the village, St. Francis began to visit with the people. First, he stopped at the butchers, next at the cobblers, followed by a walk to the home of a woman who recently lost her husband. After that, they stopped at the school to chat with the teacher, this continued throughout the entire day. Finally, St. Francis told his disciple that it was time to go home. The student was shocked and he didn't understand. But we came here to preach, he reminded St. Francis. You haven't preached yet. St. Francis answered, haven't we? People have watched us, listened to us, responded to us, every word we have spoken, Every deed we have done has been a sermon. We have preached all day. That's what being transparent is about. That's what's being what you need to do to make a disciple. So we need to get out of our four walls. We need to go out where the people are. We need to be a disciple ourselves and know scripture. And we need to be transparent. I think, in order to fulfill the Great Commission. A lot of people like to use this Great Commission as a missionary thing, as an evangelistic thing, and it is, it is, but it's not limited to evangelists or missionaries. It is given, even if you look back in verse 17, it says when, referring they, the disciples saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. This command was given to everyone, even those who doubted. He didn't say, you know, those who doubt, you stand over here, and I'll deal with you later. Now, you faithful ones, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them the things that I have taught you. And, and when you come to the faith where you really should be, then we can talk. That no. He said it to all of them, and he's saying to all of us today, regardless of where we are in our faith journey, we have a place in God's work. The three R's. The third one is reassurance, and I love the second part of verse 20. And Jesus said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the ages. Surely I am with you always. What reassurance we have. I love the word always. That's an absolute. It doesn't mean sometimes. It doesn't mean when we feel pious or when we feel religious or when we're happy 
or when we're feeling generous, it's not based upon feelings. It's based upon who Jesus is, his very nature, fully human, fully divine. And he is saying to us, I will be with you always. That means if we make a mistake, or if we were tempted and fell with that temptation, Jesus is still with us. He's there ready to pick us back up, put us on our feet, forgive us if we are genuinely repentant, help us to encourage us, to give us the strength to go on, to, to give us the, the, the sense that we are not walking in the valley alone. He is always with us, and he will be with us until the end of the age. And so that means we don't have to worry. He will walk beside us. We can do the Great Commission because of the promise that he will be right next to us, helping us. He gave us the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us and to teach us and to comfort us. What a great God we serve. How amazing Jesus is. The three R's. We can rest in his authority, knowing that he knows what's best all the time. We have a responsibility as his children to continue the work that he started here on earth. And he's telling us what that work is. But we also need to remember, we need to do it in his authority, not our own. This is not about the kingdom of me. It is about the kingdom of God. And we can be reassured, that third R, that he is always with us. He will never leave us. Another absolute word. He will never leave us, nor forsake us, no matter what we do. He is constantly calling to us, come back, I love you. I want you back in the family. That is the God that we serve. You know, our Lutheran uh, brothers and sisters, I, I had to, I don't know, I was a little distressed, uh, let's put it that way, with the news media. When Grace Lutheran came to us after the church burned down, there was a lot of news coverage about that. The fire that they had that destroyed their church, but also that the fact that the American Baptist Church in the neighborhood opened their doors to the Lutherans to allow them to come in and they were with us for three years while they rebuilt their church and it was a wonderful experience for us but i was distressed because so many people thought this was just amazing it should not have been amazing it should have been a common everyday occurrence that we reach out to others and they would reach out to us in our time of need that's what jesus would want us all to do and you know they i saw on facebook this week the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod wrote something like this. They said, you know, the coronavirus is microscopic. None of us can see it. It is so, so tiny that you need major magnification of a microscope even to try to find it. But look what it has done. In a short period of time, it has turned the world upside down. People who were asked maybe five years ago um, where they thought they would be in five years, every one of us were wrong. No one had any hint of what we would be living in today. And so our Lutheran brothers and sisters wrote that if the virus could do something that powerful to change our lives, what do you think a grain the size of a mustard seed would do for the faith. The faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed. A mustard seed is the smallest seed we have. If I had it in my hand, you wouldn't be able to see it. What if we exercised the faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed? How that would change. How that could change the face of the earth. Something to think about for a minute. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your authority that we can rest in you. 
It doesn't depend on us. It depends on you. And our job as your helper is to ask you for instructions, to ask you for guidance. Help us never to forget that. And Father, give us the courage and the strength to go, to go outside our four walls, to get away from our comfort zones. Life is messy out there, but you went. You gave us the example. And so Lord, help us to follow your example and to go out and show that we do care about what's going on in other people's lives. And Lord, help us to be reassured, to know that you are always, 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 under all circumstances, you are always with us. And for that, we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.